Hi, and welcome to the first episode officially of the Butt Fumbles and Buzzer Beaters podcast. My name is Joseph Short, and I'll be your host. I'm glad you're here. If you're watching, listening through YouTube or Spotify, I'm very happy that uh, I've reached out to you, and hopefully we can get this thing rolling, and I want to make this a really regular thing. Hopefully this becomes like a weekly podcast that I release every week with uh, with the content that you guys would enjoy. Uh, today, we got a really cool episode up in front of us. We got Super Bowl talk. We got Deshaun Watson trade talks. We got basketball talk and at the end of the episode we're going to be talking to three women soccer players here at Virginia Tech so that's very very cool and I'm really excited so let's get into it. Today is February 5th 2021 and I'm going to be releasing this tomorrow February 6th and Super Bowl 55 it's going to be a good game it's going to be a really really good game let me check my note my notes here. I you know the matchup between the Chiefs and the Buccaneers I think is going to be it's an astounding one. I mean, I think they both have high caliber offenses with high caliber players. I mean, you got to think about it. Tampa Bay has the greatest quarterback of all time. They have Mike Evans, one of the best up, go up and get it wide receivers in the league. They have Chris Godwin who's a very, very, very good wide receiver. They have Rob Gronkowski, who's still as consistent as ever, even after retirement for a year or two. And on the flip side, you got Kansas city who has Tyreek Hill, they have the MVP, Pat Mahomes, and they have Mecole Harmon, they have Sammy Watkins, they have Clyde edwards Air. That's a good team. And it's this Sunday, February 7th at 6.30. They're playing at Raymond James Stadium in Tampa, which I find to be super interesting because there's never been a team in the NFL to ever host the Super Bowl in, in the Super Bowl era in the past 55 years. And I does that give them kind of an advantage is, is kind of the question. I mean, I guess so. I mean, Florida is allowing the Buccaneers to have fans in the stadium. And I mean, you know, if they can afford the $25,000, $100,000 tickets to the Super Bowl, it, it's an absurd price, but I mean, they're going to go, you know, and for the first team to host it, especially with Brady going after his seventh ring and his 10th appearance. I mean, that's nuts. And I think it's going to be a good game. The line is the chiefs by less than three and a half. I think that They'll cover the spread. I, I like. I think that they'll cover the spread. I think it's gonna be a really, really close game. The over under is actually only fifty six point five, which is shocking to me because, like I said, these are two high caliber offenses with a lot of high caliber players, and their defenses they're not great per se. They're not bad by any means. I think they've been solid defenses. I mean, they made it to the Super Bowl for a reason, but with Tampa Bay and, and they've got a really good front seven, but they don't really have that great of a secondary. And it's kind of the flip side. I mean, Kansas city really has a solid defense all around, but it, they, there's no one that really makes you go like Uga in, in any of their positions besides maybe Teran Matthew, the, the honey badger back there as a safety. So I think, you know, Brady and, and Mahomes are going to have their way. And then Fournette and Clyde Edwards Hilaire are going to have their way and on the ground. So we're just going to have to see with the way they ground and pound or if they, throw it through the air and and it's it's really just dependent on what the offenses do i don't think the uh the defenses really are going to do a ton against what's coming up for their the off the opposing offenses excuse me so uh, the money line for kansas city is minus 175 the tampa bay money lines plus 150 again i think they're going to cover the spread uh for the over under at 56 and a half because the offense that it's the offense is just greater than the defense at this point it's today's nfl you know it's just going to be high caliber it's gonna be ground and pound it's it, it's not gonna end up like uh super bowl 53 where it was like 10 to 3 is the final score and you know it was just a really defense uh, people called it boring i wouldn't say it was boring but you know it's not it's gonna be a lot probably like a lot la like last year's super bowl where patrick mahomes came back with like eight minutes left in the fourth quarter and you know stomped all over the 49ers there in the final eight minutes of the game and they they basically crumbled but that's you know the, cl the classic kyle shanahan type of thing so moving on from Super Bowl stuff, there's a star quarterback that plays for the Houston Texans, and he doesn't want to play for the Houston Texans anymore. His name is Sean Watson. They basically took him, and then they traded his best weapon. They gave him a burnt-out, one-time great – not great, but one-time really, really good season running back and David Johnson. They, they traded away DeAndre Hopkins to Arizona, and – you got to think if you're Deshaun Watson, like you just traded away my best player. You just, you just traded away my best asset. They made it in the playoffs last year with that squad and with Deshaun Watson leading them. And now Deshaun has nothing. And it just goes to show if your team isn't building around you, 
then what are you going to do? I mean, he's honestly just kind of stuck. And then, you know, he signed a massive contract extension in the off season because the Texans saw him as an asset. And now basically he's recognizing that they screwed him over with, you know, getting rid of his best player and, and it's all him. And that's why the Texans did so poorly this year is because it was all under Sean. And honestly, I can't blame him. And, you know, Brett Favre came out this week and was like, I, I don't remember the exact quote, but I remember basically he was telling Deshaun, shut up and be miserable while you're earning money. I, I just, I don't see why Deshaun should have to do that. And I, I think he's gone probably it'll probably take them a while to, to trade him because they're going to ha- ask this super high price. Because if you look at the Matthew Stafford trade, Matthew Stafford, although one of the most criminally underrated players in the NFL, he is, older and Deshaun Watson's not even hitting his prime so you're seeing what you're getting out of Deshaun Watson prior to his his actual prime and you got to think like Matthew Stafford got two first round picks and a player in order to get him to LA what is a team going to have to give up for Deshaun Watson I think the the most suitable place for him is probably the Jets if I had to guess I mean they they got a lot of picks they they're not far off from being a decent team. They drafted a great tackle last year in Mackay Becton, but you got to think like he's got, he's either going to go there. And I think a, a sneak cause people are saying, Oh, it's either New York jets or it's going to be the giants or it's going to be uh, Miami. And, you know, I'm like, Oh, they just drafted Tua. Are they not all in on Tua? What's going on there? I think honestly, they're all in on Tua. I think Tua is a talented player. He just needs time to develop. But with, Deshaun, I think a very, very sneaky, like sleeper place for him to go. And I might just be, you know, rattling off words at this point, but Jacksonville has the first overall pick that could look very attractive to the Texans. Now with the, would they draft another Clemson quarterback in the first round and basically screw up Trevor Lawrence's outcome for the next few years? Maybe, but I mean, they'd get all that draft stock back. So I don't know. I mean, honestly, if I had to guess, it'd be the Jets, but don't sleep on the Jags. I mean, I, I, it's honestly, you know, you're taking Trevor Lawrence, who is supposed to be one of the greatest prospects to ever come out of college football, and then Sean Watson, who is a top five quarterback in today's game. So honestly, they got a decision to make, and they're going to have to make that decision. Another quarterback that's probably going to hit the market, it's been coming in news that his market's heating up, is uh, my favorite player for my favorite team Carson Wentz and honestly you know Howie Roseman up there in Philly kind of screwed the guy over you got to think he had that great season 2017 and I know people are tired of hearing about that and I'm honestly tired of hearing about it because you know it was the last time that was really fun to watch these Eagles play Uh, he comes back in 2018 has a solid statistical season and then 2019 he carries practice squad players into the playoffs and he gets a dirty hit by Jadavian Clowney to get knocked out. And then this last year, he, he looked like he was drafted in the sixth round and he, he'd never started an NFL game before he was making poor decisions. And he looked like he was just nervous at all times. And you got to think like with the Texans, it's, it's comparable to, to what happened with the Texans and Watson. He didn't get drafted around him, like what he could have had. And by meaning that is, is meaning Howie Roseman, uh, let's see, in this past year, he drafted Jalen Rager, who's still unproven. The case is still out on Jalen Rager. I, I'm, I'm hoping that they find something for him to work. And instead of drafting LSU wide receiver Justin Jefferson, who went to Minnesota and had a record-breaking season, he absolutely tore the NFL up this year. And in the second round, he could have drafted more wide receiver help. I'm, I don't know exactly who's available there, but – you know, he drafted Jalen Hurts, a Heisman candidate quarterback from the year before. And, you know, you got to think your your confidence is shot. And they're basically saying, oh, it's insurance if Carson gets hurt again. But like, honestly, if you're a player and like you're not even just a player, if you're at any position at any job and they're like, oh, we're just bringing this guy in just in case you screw up again or you, you know, you can't perform your job to your highest capabilities again. And you just got to think like uh, either that's going to fuel a fire inside you or that's going to make you feel like you're, team your your organization your job doesn't believe in you so honestly with Wentz I either he's going to stay in Philadelphia and he's going to compete with Jalen Hurts and Nick Sirianni's new uh, system and his new coaching staff or he's going to 
be traded. And if he's traded, he's going to go to Indianapolis with Frank Reich, the guy who was there when he had his MVP year. And he had a 33 to seven touchdown to interception ratio and he won 11 games and 11 out of the 13 possible games that he played. And he threw a touchdown on a torn ACL and LCL. They're going to have to find, somebody's going to have to find a way to revive that player. And I, I don't think the guy's done. I think he's 28 or 29. He's just entering his prime. He's young. He's, he's not an old guy at all. He just, they, he needs something, somebody to lead, believe in him. And if Doug Peterson was the issue, Doug Peterson was the issue. They fired him. They're just going to have to see with that. And, um, you know, I think it, it'll be interesting to see what happens with Carson Wentz. I think, you know, he's a great guy, stand up human being, and he's a talented player. He's really got the skills to, to play football and at a high level. And he's, he's got very interesting and unique type of play, uh, uh, type of play. So we're, we're, it's honestly, it's, it's up in the air at this point with Wentz and we're just going to have to see. And um, moving on from that, moving on from football, because football is just a Super Bowl right now, besides all this free agent quote unquote talk and all of this kind of, you know, hypothetical situation, all this media hype from guys on Twitter, guys in the radio are, are hyping it up. Not a lot going on besides the Super Bowl. So we're going to have to see uh, moving on to the NBA and, Here's some cold, hard facts for you. If you're a fan of the Brooklyn Nets, I'm sorry. This is the truth. They're an overrated basketball team. And why I say that is they have three superstars, three max contract type of players in Kyrie, KD, and James Harden. However, you look at the way they play basketball, okay? James Harden and Kyrie Irving, are not going to be reliable on the defense. They are offensive players. They're shooters. They're handling the ball at all times, both of them. I mean, they, they account for probably, I guess, I would guess 70% of the Nets' points at this point. Uh, KD's a reliable defender. I'm not going to you know, trash on KD at all. I think that guy's a, a great player. But you look at them, and I, I saw this this week, I think on Twitter or Instagram or something, where the Nets have, if they continue the way they're playing now, they have the highest offensive rating of any team ever, which is insane. You got to think about teams in the past. And I don't, they, even when KD was in Golden State with Clay and Steph Curry, you know, they have that, which is a great asset to have. That's a great piece of your team. Their defense, on the other hand, is the statistically like again if they continue the way they've been playing and this continues for the rest of the season their defense statistically will be the worst ever so you can't have that balance and i honestly i can't see them making it past the second round of the eastern conference playoffs i mean there's the bucks you have to worry about the 76ers who you have we're going to talk about in a second you have to worry about they they can't make it with that be that bad of a defensive rating. Pe- teams are going to play offense on them, and they're not going to be able to score enough to support the, such terrible defense that they have. And speaking about the 76ers, when they have the starting five that they normally have, I mean, I know they lost last night to Portland, and Portland didn't even have Damian Lillard out on the, the court. When they have their starting five of Ben Simmons, Danny Green, Seth Curry, Joel Embiid, and Tobias Harris, that team's unbeatable. That's the team that's going to win the East. If they can stay healthy, especially with the way Joel Embiid's playing, that's the MVP of the league. And I know I'm biased. I'm a Philadelphia 76ers fan. I'm a Philadelphia sports fan. You just have to look at the it factor that Joel Embiid, and Joel Embiid is bringing to the floor every night when he plays. He's honestly just complete takeover, complete shutdown of everyone else. He's the offensive and defense, defensive star of the field. And there's no stopping him. There's no one that's going to stop Joel Embiid. And if they continue the way they've been playing, especially if their starting five has been as good as they've been and their bench has been as good as it's been, that's going to be the team to beat in the East. Not Milwaukee. It's going to be the Sixers. And I say that because Milwaukee is a one-trick pony with Giannis. And not that Giannis is a bad player. Giannis is probably one of the best players in the league right now, and he'll probably end up being one of the great, greatest players ever to play the games athletically. But that's not a team built to make the playoffs and continue into the playoffs. They've the bucks have invested everything they've had in Giannis and they, you just got to think what kind of continuity do you have with just that and just Giannis and maybe Chris Middleton sometimes and Brooke Lopez. Okay. It's your superstar is Giannis. And that guy is not going to carry you into a finals victory. I'm, I'm 
I just don't see it happening. So I, I give me a freezing cold take on this. I don't see it happening personally. Uh, a team that's really exciting for me to watch is a Phoenix Suns. And why I say that is they have Devin Booker, one of the best scorers in the league. They have Chris Paul, one of the greatest guards of all time. And they have DeAndre Ayton, who is a very, very solid up-and-coming big man. They have the pieces parts there, and they're they're on the rise. I mean, I, I don't know their record off the top of my head. I could probably look it up, but I, I think that the Suns are going to start competing soon. They're not going to compete this year, maybe not next year, because obviously LeBron James and the Lakers out there in L.A., they're going to run stuff for, for right now. I mean, I don't see the Clippers making any other difference than they made in the playoffs last year. And – I don't think Paul George and Kawhi have that or mainly Paul George. I know how Kawhi can play in the playoffs, but they, they're just not consistent enough to compete with the Lakers. I just don't see teams competing with the Lakers. I mean, the Rockets, you know, they have a few players who have been playing well that hadn't played well previously. I, the Lakers are going to run the West and whoever can show up in the East. Moving on from basketball, we have, Three very special guests, friends of mine here. I live in Blacksburg, Virginia. I do not attend Virginia Tech, but I live here. And three friends of mine that I've made very good friends with this year. Uh, we have from the Virginia Tech women's soccer team, we have S.A. Phillips, who is a goalkeeper. And we have Emily Gray, who's a midfielder, and Emily McCarter, who's also a midfielder. And more on them in just a second. Let me grab my notes. <clears throat> Excuse me. It is a bit chilly outside. So this is from Hokiesports.com. All due respect, this is where I got my information from. So for Emily Gray, she's a junior. She is a native of Sewell, New Jersey. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right. So Emily, I'm sorry if I'm not. She played for Penn Fusion DA as, a, as her uh, club team. She has earned multiple Team of the Week awards, including 2020 ACC Offensive Player of the Week, 2020 College Soccer News Women's Nation Team of the Week. She was 2019 United Soccer's United Soccer Coaches All-Atlantic Region third team midfielder. She was a 2018 All-ACC freshman team player. She was a two-time All-State second team. She was a 2019 and 2020 All-ACC academic team. She made the All-ACC third team in 2020. And she is a member of the U-20 U.S. Women's National Team. And her major in school is a sports media and analytics. So that's a really cool. She's got a really thick rap sheet. And it's, she's got a real nice paragraph there on, on Hokiesports.com. She's well known around these parts for playing soccer here. And next up, we got Emily McCarter. She's a junior. She played at South Carolina United FC. She's a native of Charleston, South Carolina. She, currently, she leads the Hokies in consecutive starts with 39. That's an impressive stat considering you got to keep your body and mind healthy. For 39 consecutive starts, that's a lot. You know, playing a contact sport like soccer, I mean, it's continuous. They're running – you know, 15,000 bajillion miles a game. So the, the fact that Emily's running this much and staying healthy for this long, is, it's an impressive stat. And in 2019, Emily McCarter became the first Hokie to log a multi-assist game since 2016. And Emily is a civil engineering major. Now, moving on to last but certainly not least, a very, very close friend of mine, S.A. Phillips. She is a redshirt sophomore from Pauley's Island, South Carolina. She also played for South Carolina United FC. She registered her freshman year due to an injury and she's coming back from that. She's appeared two times in the Hokies 2020 campaign. She was a member of the 2019 and 2020 all academic ACC teams. And she's a really courageous person. She's got a good attitude about everything and she, she might not be the starter of the team but she knows that her role in the team is important. So I'm excited to talk to these three girls and let's get them all on the call. All right, so now we have our guests. We have S.A. Phillips and Emily McCarter and Emily Gray. Welcome to the show. First episode, first special guest. How are you guys doing? Doing good. Thanks for having us. Yeah, doing well. Glad to have you guys. All right, so first question I got here for you. I got, I got a couple written down because I got to be semi-professional about this. Uh, so last spring, obviously, uh, we're almost a year into this pandemic, and last spring, all season got taken away from you, right? And so how is it like having... A, the season stripped, B, having to prepare yourselves over quarantine, like at your houses or wherever else without having any of the team activities. And then going into this season with all the new protocols, all the new stuff where you're like, 
oh snap like this is not last season you know like this is i have to wear a mask i have to do this we can't shake hands after the game whatever else even though you're playing a full contact sport it's like oh these protocols are still in place we still have to be covid conscious like how is it like adjusting from last season to this season essentially I mean, I think I can speak for all of us. It was pretty much, we just flipped on our heads. Like that was something we'd never encountered before. None of us had ever gotten a COVID test, like just about everybody else. But, and then going from having never had one to having one three times a week yeah. at 6 a.m. was just kind of crazy. Um, also just kind of not having the camaraderie between your opponents. It was a little strange not having to, you know, say good game or be able to even be around them shake the coach's hand. That was kind of strange. You guys want to talk about being home and like training at home and stuff like that? Yeah, I know. Like for me, um, it kind of was like a blessing in disguise. Cause I guess like I got, I mean, I was coming back from ACL injury, so I hadn't, I wouldn't have played anyway in the spring. And um, it gave me like a little bit more time to prepare, I guess myself and be on a level playing field with everybody else because I mean, it sucks for them. They weren't playing, but it kind of helped me like put my mind to things because I was, like I said, I was at a level playing field with everybody else at that point. Um, yeah. You want to talk? Um, I think overall, I mean, having to experience everything with COVID, I think um, us and like all of our other teammates, we really just had to like be adaptive and fluid with everything else that was going around with us. So there was constantly something changing and we had to find a way to change with it, if that makes any sense. So. Yeah, and like something I remember from like even pregame when we would do the walkouts and stuff like normally after they announced the starting lineups, we go and like shake everyone's hand, like say, like, have, hope you have a good game. And instead this year, the refs were like, okay, like the introductions are done. And we would just be like, wave over to the other team, like, hey, have a good game. <laughs> and then just like, it was weird. It was just kind of a weird dynamic of things. And obviously post game, um, some teams were like, saying like good job stuff like that interacted with us and other teams like their staff were like no like as soon as the game's over walk away um kind of thing so it was just really interesting an interesting dynamic I guess um but like we like they said we really adapted I'm honestly like so used to it now it's hard to think of a time when it wasn't the case when everything was normal right and so like again with the with the COVID stuff you guys had the opportunity to have fans and which the football team didn't even get to have fans, but you guys had your fans and it's not like it used to be obviously, cause you guys have your, your shirtless boys that come out to the game, but it's still not the same where you have to have a certain like list per player from each team. And it's like, I guess that's kind of a weird atmosphere for you guys playing in front of a lesser crowd and, and not having your typical like crowd and having the fans there, obviously. Um, so for that stuff, how does it compare? Cause I know at least, for SA and Emily Gray, you guys have been sidelined with major injuries, at least in your collegiate career. I'm not sure about you, Emily McCarter, but how does, how does it compare kind of like when you're like, Oh God, like the season's gone to, Oh God, the season's gone because I'm hurt. Not just because there's a pandemic happening in the world. Like, how does it be like, Oh, like this is not what it's like, but it's for everybody, you know? I mean, I think for the both of us, like being, having that spring season for me was like the first time I actually felt recovered from my injury you know mentally and physically as well just feeling at maybe not my best but like I was getting really close and that was something I hadn't felt in a long time um, since freshman year and so just to kind of play that first game and then it was like oh no more you know and it was just kind of bittersweet because I was ready to start getting in into the weight room and start maxing out and trying to get my muscles back and working back into being as fit as possible. I think that spring we were all just super fit. We were running a fitness test every week. It was one of those things where like you could feel that that season was going to be good. Yeah. And then it was just kind of, you know, it just kind of stopped. And then yeah. we went home and none of those resources were the same. So some of us, I mean, I know we have a kid from New York and she had to be inside all the, all the time. Like she, she couldn't even go outside. And so like her environment versus mine, like I could go out and South Carolina was basically all open, but there was nowhere for me to train. There was nowhere for me to lift. So it was just kind of annoying because being here and in this atmosphere with the resources we have, it's like, 
you don't know what you have until it's taken away from you. And trying to do that at home was just not a good thing to try and implement. But I think the biggest difference for me uh, when I got injured, it was just kind of like, how did I, how did this happen to me? Uh, Cause it was only me that was hurt. That's how I felt. I was a very alone in that, in the sense that like everyone else could keep going and I was just staying where I was. Um, but then to have everyone's like season taken away from them, it was definitely different to think that like other people are going through that too. And like, we're all fighting through this together. Um, so that was the major big difference for me. Right. Yeah, I would agree with especially that last part. Like when you're injured, like the timing of everything for me was like last fall, I was injured halfway through the season. You like went from playing every game, almost every minute, then not traveling, not being part of anything at that point. Like you, it really like crushes you inside because um, it's really hard. And then the spring was kind of like, all right, I'm getting back acclimated, acclimated with the team, like starting to do some things with them in practice. And then all of a sudden COVID takes that all away. So that was like, I think the difference, like she said, was that when you're injured, it's more like you're the only one or maybe the couple of people on your team that are injured are feeling like lonely and without the game. Um, but with COVID, like it was the same for everybody. So, yeah. All right. Uh, I got one final question. It's kind of a loaded question. Not really. But according to the website, I, I'm sure this is true because obviously why would they put it on y'all's website if it wasn't true? But you guys sit at five and eight on the year. You guys, you guys have four spring games coming up in March, starting with, I believe, Marshall. It's like March 7th, March 8th. UNC Charlotte. UNC yeah. Charlotte, Marshall. My <laughs> no worries. Um, so what do you guys think needs to be done and has the team changed enough since the fall in order to get get past that hump pat, uh, over that 500 hump and turn it around in time for the tournament and obviously you guys are playing out of ACC opponents mostly in the fall you're playing in ACC what's got to change for you guys and how do you have to prepare and get ready for the season coming up in the spring um I think coming off the fall the end of the fall season our team finally started to pick it up and work together more as a team and we were having better success at the end of our season than at the beginning of the season because we had been working with each other through the fall going through all the obstacles COVID and non-COVID and so I think by the end of it we were at that point where we were at a pretty good stage and we were pretty satisfied I guess would maybe be a good term for the end of the season and then once um, the fall ended we have this large now we have this large gap where we haven't really been doing much as a team for like winter and then now we're back and I think it's hard to pick up where we left off at the in the fall so I think what we need to work on is trying to just build that team chemistry up again so we can be prepared for those games we have in less than a month now or yeah. close to a month now so yeah I think that's a great point because it's hard to keep that momentum going especially when like there's not that we don't have any scrimmages before our next first game this yeah. spring. So um, it'll be like super important for us in training to kind of keep um, high standards and be competitive so that when we jump into that first game, that team will have played multiple games already. And that will be our first game of the spring season. So um, we just need to be ready. And um, we actually talked the other day of like respecting our opponent. And that's like, especially important this year because or this spring specifically, because that opponent maybe isn't an ACC team, but um, they already will have played a bunch of games and um, could be at a higher starting point than us at that point in our in our season. Um, and like thinking about our record, I mean, it was a tough fall in terms of our schedule, but um, I, we have to pretty much win all these games in this, this spring to be considered for the NCAA tournament, which I think is kind of a cool situation because um, I mean, even this fall, we, to make the ACC tournament, we had to like win out at the end of the season. Um, so it kind of puts this pressure on you toward the end um, and makes a goal seem achievable um, with that, um, with having to win all four games, so. Yeah, I mean, the, the thing that I, I played sports in high school, I've coached high school sports. It's hard with kind of a gap between things. Like you have, 
momentum swinging your way, especially at the end of the fall for you guys, you guys started hot. I mean, you had a tough schedule. You guys had top ranked opponents like FSU and UNC, but you, you made the most of it. And especially at the end of the year or at the end of the season, rather, you, you try to get that momentum swinging. And now you got to carry over basically three months and, and be prepared for someone who's already been playing games. Whereas you guys, that's your first exposure to a soccer team that isn't Virginia tech. So it's, I can imagine it being difficult for, for all of you guys, just preparing mentally and physically, like we have to be ready for soccer. We have to be ready to play a full on game now, but like we can't play it until March. Yeah. I think that's definitely going to be the toughest thing to think about is just how do we implement game situations and training without having a game? Um, it's been, we've struggled with that since we were here freshman year. It's just kind of something you have to do. And the scrimmages always help. It's something yeah. where we get to see our lineup. We get to see what formation we want to play and who's the best and which kind of roles. And then having to go into this season, needing to win all five games or all four games and not having those chances to make mistakes, not having those that error bar is really important um, and just, just kind of scary altogether because we really don't know what our team's going to look like in the next month. You know, we could have injuries galore. We could have people get COVID. We could have just the most random things that can impact our team since we have such a long gap between now and our first game. Um, but I also think it just really is going to test our teamwork and uh, camaraderie like we talked about the other day and our leadership development. Um, I think it's going to take everybody on this squad to get us through that first game. And I mean, we, we need to be prepared for anything. And I think we have a good group this year to be able to push through the, that pressure of needing to win. Um, but yeah, we'll see. I think another thing worth noting is like the spring now we lost like six at least people on our team from the fall our seniors are no longer with us and um a transfer so I think that's like another thing because we can't play 11 v 11 at this point we don't have 22 play like 10 and 10 field players we have three goalies obviously but like um so that's like a tough thing to replicate game situations when you don't have a full roster that you normally have in the fall so yeah, and, I, and I imagine, I mean, especially when I was coaching lacrosse last year and the year before, my players got really fed up with just competing against themselves because they knew what was going to happen. So when you're competing against your teammates, obviously there's competition there. It's friendly competition, obviously, but you get tired of, we're not necessarily tired of, but it gets repetitive to a point where you're like, okay, I know what you're about to do. And I know your moves. I know what you're going to, you're attacking me with. And flip side of that, like you're going to go into a game even if you study all the film and you study how they play, it's going to be a completely different atmosphere where you're like, okay, you're not my teammate. You're an opponent. You're somebody else. And that's just kind of where you guys are sitting right now because of the transition from fall to spring seasons. Right. Yeah, yeah. for sure. Yeah. yeah. All right. That's all I really got for you guys. I really appreciate you guys coming on and uh, hope you guys have a great rest of your day. I, you know, this is my first episode. So hopefully I did well. You guys did great. I appreciate you guys coming out. Yeah, of thanks Thank for you. having us. Thanks. Thank you. All right, I want to give a huge shout out to SA, Emily, and Emily. That was a great interview. I really enjoyed having them on. And I want to, pre I want to show my appreciation to you guys if you're tuning in. You know, I, this is my first episode. I really think it went well. And, you know, hopefully you guys enjoy it and continue to tune in. Next week, we have a very special guest again. His name is Devontae Chandler. He is a captain for Elon University Football. He graduated in 2018 from Thomasdale, just like me. And I'm very excited to have him on and ask him about his upcoming spring football season with the CAA. And it's going to be really exciting. And that'll come out next Saturday. I'll record on Wednesday, but I'll drop it on Saturday. Hopefully we can get this on a Saturday daily basis. And you know, we can just continue to make this a good thing. And I appreciate you. I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day whenever you're listening to this. And share this with a friend. Put it on Twitter. Put it on Facebook. Put it on Instagram. Share it with your family. Share it with your grandma. I don't mind. As, as long as you guys want to tune in, talk sports, talk entertainment, anything you guys want to do, just let me know. And, I, of, of course, I appreciate feedback. You can 
direct message me on Instagram and you can direct message me on Twitter. And if you have my phone number, feel free to contact me. I, I'm very open to criticism and I really want to con continue to make this a good thing. So I appreciate you. Thank you for tuning in to Butt Fumbles and Buzzer Beaters episode ones. And I hope you have a great day. Thanks. <laughs>